Friends, good morning. I'm Dave Bianchin. It is my joy to be on the pastoral staff here today and to welcome you to our service of worship today. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Uh, welcome to Christ Church. We're glad that you're here with us today. Whether you're joining us online or here in the sanctuary, we're delighted to connect with you today. If this is your first Sunday with us or if you've been with us for some time, we would uh, love to have, make sure that you're connected well in the life of the church. We'd love to get to know you and help you get to know people as well. If you're online this morning, you can follow the prompts on the screen. If you're here with us, pick up a Connect card, if you would, on the way out today, and it'll give you some information about ways that you can connect here in the life of the church. Let's be called to worship this morning with these words from Psalm 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to all generations. And so let us make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Let us come before the Lord our God. Let us sing his praises. Let us declare his glory. Let us proclaim his holy name. Friends, let us worship God. Please be seated. Would you join me, please, in a moment of prayer? Let us pray. Holy and loving God, thank you for meeting us here this morning. Thank you for the newness of each morning and the powerful grace that you inject into our lives. We love you and celebrate you for who you are, our mighty and redeeming God. Lord, we have each come here this morning for a variety of reasons. Some of us are weary and need your strength. Some of us are happy and want to celebrate your grace. Some of us are searching for meaning and purpose. Some of us need to be reminded that you love us. But we all need your strength to uphold us, and we all need the fellowship of other believers, and we're grateful that you provide that for us. And Lord, we all know that we need your forgiveness. So hear us, Lord, in this moment of silence as we each confess our sins to you.
Almighty God, in whom and to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. I have some words of assurance for you from the Apostle Paul, and I'm constantly reminded as I read what he wrote in Scripture that it's not just thoughts of theology, it is his personal confession of how God has graced him. And so hear these words from 1 Timothy. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, immortal invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and forever. And for, friends, in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. join us in prayer. Heavenly Father, on this day set aside to celebrate mothers, we approach your throne on behalf of all the women you have so beautifully created in your character. We thank you for instilling each woman with a unique combination of gifts and talents, strengths and skills, making our lives richer. We are grateful for the women you have entrusted with the care of children and for those who have acted as our spiritual mothers, guiding us through life and modeling your love. Dear God, we thank you for all the women who love us. We are so lucky to have wonderful moms, grandmas, aunts, 
cousins, sisters, friends, and so many others to guide us, lead us, and nurture us. We are especially thankful for the time moms give to their kids. We are thankful for their patience and kindness. We are thankful for their wisdom and humor. We are thankful for their unconditional love. We are thankful for the fun times we have together and that they are thankful with their hugs and kisses when we have tough times. We pray you give each mom strength and peace. We pray you give each mom energy and joy. We pray you let each mom know how much they are loved. We pray that we honor the amazing women in our lives in all that we do. Most of all, Lord, remind us to cherish the special women who have carried us, who have nurtured us, and who have prayed for your well-being. Heavenly Father, while this is a day of great joy for so many women, we recognize that this day also brings pain and heartache for others. We ask you to bring hope and healing to families separated by circumstance or hardship. We pray that every mom who is exhausted and in need of help may have an opportunity to rest and that you will provide someone to walk beside them. We give thanks for the influential women we love and we miss today who are already joined with you in heaven. We pray for healing hearts that are broken because these women are gone from our lives. Be powerfully present with the women who are in failing health, who are alone, and who might feel lost, especially in this time of isolation and uncertainty. We grieve with those who are desperately want to be mothers, but have not had their desire yet met. We pray your supernatural presence will be with moms who have lost a child to illness, accidents, or violence. For all these circumstances, and for others unnamed, we pause for a moment of silence. And now, together, let's pray the pray prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for leading us in prayer this morning. It's uh, great to have so many moms joining us this morning. Um, and one of the things I'd like to do is really put in a plug for our women's ministry here at the church. If you're not familiar with it, we have wonderful programs, both here and online, podcasts and things to connect you with other women and to connect you and help you grow deeper in your relationship with Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to visit the women's ministry section on our church's website and see the variety of things that are happening there which can help you to grow in your faith. And be sure to check out a podcast and as you're driving around or walking around doing something, uh, allow the Lord to enrich your life through the resources that we have here through our women's ministry at church. On this Mother's Day, I have certainly given lots of thought to the influential women in my life. I, on my side of the family, I think of I think of my mom and my grandmother and my sister and what wonderful people that they are. Um, but also on my wife's side of the family, my mother-in-law was one of the most wonderful people I have ever known. But of course, the most influential person for me is my wife, Julie. When Julie and I got married, I thought I was a pretty generous person. But my marriage to Julie has given me a re-education in what it means to be an open and generous person for others. And even after 38 years, I continue to marvel at the ways she continually seeks to make an impact on the lives of others. She taught for 30 years. She takes the time to help people whenever she can. Uh, every year before the weather starts to get cold, she puts together a bunch of what she calls blessing bags to pass those out to folks who are there at stop signs. But I think perhaps the most amazing thing about her is that I see that she continues to grow in generosity. She's always looking for new ways to help people. She's willing to give her time. And she handles our finances, which is a very wise move on my part, I will say. And uh, she's always asking, both at the beginning of the year and a couple other times during the year, can we do more? Uh, in light of all the blessings and the ways God has been generous with us, 
Can we be more generous with our time and our talent? And I hope that you're growing in that sense of grace and knowledge as well, not only of the Lord Jesus, but in how he calls us to give our lives to others even as he has given his life to us. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it, that God who doesn't really need our money chooses to use us and to use our resources to participate in the ministry of this church and in missions all around the world. And we certainly invite you to partner together with this to further his amazing work. You can follow the prompts on the screen if you're at home or you can drop your gift in the basket on the way out today. But let's worship God in the generosity of giving his tithes and our offerings. I believe. I believe. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe in. The creation of the world. The parting of the Red Sea. God's provision of manna. That Daniel survived in the lion's den. And Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. I believe that Jesus turned water into wine, healed the sick, turned a meager lunch of bread and fish into a feast for thousands. He walked on water, stilled a storm, and rose from the dead. This I believe. This I believe. Jesus. He healed my heart. He healed my heart. Transformed my life. My life. My life. And one day. One day. I will be with Jesus face to face. For eternity. For eternity. This I believe.
Well, good morning to everyone once again. It is a joy to be together on this Mother's Day. And mom, if you're out there, have a wonderful day. I love you. Uh, I am excited this morning to begin part two of our series, Credo, in which we have been exploring together the amazing convictions that form the Apostles' Creed, uh, the bedrock beliefs of the Christian life that have been shared by followers of Jesus throughout the centuries. For more than 2,000 years, believers have been saying these particular words in order to remind themselves and then to share with a listening world the certain core convictions we hold about God, about his work and his plan that ultimately make a difference in our lives as we hold fast to them as other things swirl around us. In the first installment of our series, uh, Peter Stearns and I each gave a message unpacking what it means to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Uh, that idea is at the very center of the Apostles' Creed. It's why we began with that particular affirmation. It is, more importantly, at the heart of the life of every uh, committed believer of Jesus Christ. This idea that he is God's only son and he is our Lord. And if you haven't thought uh, recently very deeply about who Jesus is to you and, and how his lordship is being expressed in the practical affairs of your daily life, that is one of the most valuable things that any of us can do. If you didn't catch uh, one or both of those messages from uh, the start of our series, I also encourage you to go on back and, and listen to those and let them uh, promote some further thinking for you. I want to take you today into the Apostles' Creed at an even deeper level because the lines that follow that affirmation about Jesus tell us some very important facts about who Jesus is. And these two have big implications for our lives. And here is a doozy. Uh, this is the statement that I wanna focus in on today. We believe in a Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Now, if ever there was an unusual subject to be exploring on Mother's Day, the doctrine of the virgin birth is probably it. Uh, I, I can't imagine you've ever heard a Mother's Day message that used that particular focus. I, I doubt there was any mention in the Mother's Day cards that you got or are passing along today of a virgin birth. Uh, but I promise you that before I'm done speaking, you're going to see why this fact about Jesus, why this particular part of the Christian credo matters for moms and for all of us in a really big way. And I wanna assure you that if you're the parent of young kids, this is gonna be a G-rated message. So you can, uh, you can be at ease. The, the first reason why believing that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary matters is because it fulfills Old Testament prophecy. Now, why is that important? Well, I'm betting that if I could demonstrate to you that one of the major politicians of our time or one of the significant newscasters of our era was personally the specific fulfillment of a long list of promises and predictions made hundreds of years ago about a coming savior of this world, you would tune into that person differently, would you not? You would treat his or her actions much, much more seriously, would you not? Well, one of the reasons why Christians pay attention to the words and the works of Jesus at a level that they don't give to any other figure at all, with the possible exception of what their mom says, uh, is because the facts of Jesus' life lined up with as many as 300 Old Testament prophecies about the coming Christ, about the Messiah, the Savior of the world that we should expect. 
In fact, if you're interested in the sermon notes for today, which you can find on our website this afternoon, I'm including a link to a website that records for you all 300 and more of those biblical prophecies that were fulfilled in the person of Jesus. But today I just want to consider with you this one prophecy. Writing to the Jewish nation at a time of great trouble and confusion, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah was given a vision that God was going to enter into history one day in a very fresh way. He was going to set in motion a whole new era of hope. How will we know that the era is dawning? People would probably have asked Isaiah in his time. And Isaiah answered, and I quote, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is how you know. God's going to signal that he's doing this, that it's starting this new era. He's going to give you a sign. Oh, it better be a very bright sign, uh, I imagine people saying. Uh, There are a lot of people out there claiming to be our hope. A lot of people come along claiming to be a savior of one kind or another, a political, an economic, a romantic savior. There are a lot of people. How will we recognize that this is the one? You won't miss this sign, said Isaiah. You can't possibly miss this sign because a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. Now some people over the years, you may be interested to know, have disputed that particular translation of that text. They have uh, used a a different understanding of this text to uh, essentially push away the notion of even needing to believe in a virgin birth. Uh, And they do it by basically saying that the Hebrew word that gets translated as virgin there is more properly translated in other contexts as young woman. And it's basically saying, and a young woman will conceive and give birth to to a son. I understand why. There there is actually another text in which it clearly does mean, this word does mean young woman. But in the seven other uh, texts where this same word is used, it is clearly referring to a virgin. And, and, And furthermore, when you think about it, why would anyone regard the birth of a child to a young woman as a sign that the Savior had come? Uh, why, why in the world would that be? It's a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong. The birth of a child to any woman is a, a, a stunning thing, as we'll come back to in just a moment. But why would that be the sign that a savior had come? But if someone who was still a virgin was found to be carrying a child, and the most amazing sort of child at that, that would signify something very special was going on. I would imagine you'd agree. And then one day, it actually happened. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who were highly favored. The Lord is with you. Literally, Emmanuel, (laughs) the fulfillment of that ancient prophecy. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus, and that name means, literally, God saves. The Savior's here. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and his kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a what? A virgin. How could this be? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. When we say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, we are getting it from this story. We're not making up an idea, we're getting it 
from this particular story. And this story is about the fulfillment of a staggering, seemingly impossible prophecy. And this is just one of the hundreds of such fulfillments in the person and the work of Jesus, which is why the apostles felt it so important to keep this line before the Christian church. To, to, to enshrine a remembrance of the Virgin Mary for the church for all time because it shows that God is faithful to his promises. That they sometimes take a while to work out in our lives but that God can be trusted. And also that Jesus is a highly unusual person. <laughs> his very origin is spectacularly unusual and he is somebody that we should therefore definitely pay attention to at a level that we don't give attention to anyone else. I think that the apostles included this incredible assertion in their creed for a second reason too. It was because in this statement they are telling us that Jesus is both human and divine. Would it surprise you to know that in the life of the early church, in the first hundred, several hundred years of the Christian movement, the first big debate that was widespread was over the question, was Jesus really human? Was Jesus really human? The first believers had seen Jesus do such amazing works of wonder uh, these miracles that uh, we've been remembering already this morning. They saw him speak with an authority and with a wisdom that nobody else had. And at Easter, they became absolutely convinced that Jesus had overcome death itself, that he triumphed over the final barrier in human life. And so the question arose, did Jesus just appear to be human? I mean, as we might say, Maybe he just looked like Clark Kent, but was Superman all along. But if that was true then, the cross didn't make any sense to them. In order for the sacrifice on the cross to be real and effective, the penalty for sin that was paid there had to be laid upon a real live human being. Human beings had to have skin in the game in order for the sacrifice there to, to, to atone for the reality of sin. There had to have been a real human lamb in that sense. Um, then the apostles began thinking about it. They had seen Jesus do all of these wonders and speak with his authority and rise from the grave, yes but they'd also seen him thirst and hunger. They'd seen him weep and get tired. They'd seen him actually die. And they concluded, yes, he was definitely fully human. As the apostles progressively died off, however, the debate turned in the other direction. As the people who'd been there and seen the divine acts of Jesus passed away, the conversation now turned to the question, was Jesus really divine? Was that just made up? And by the late third and early fourth centuries, a charismatic young intellectual named Arius had gotten a lot of people's attention. Arius had argued that Jesus was actually just a human being that God endowed with special powers after he was born. He was God-like, but he was certainly not God, at least not in the sense of having existed from the beginning the way God has. And Arius actually coined his views about Jesus in a catchy little song that went tick-tock viral in his time and spread the Arian ideas all over the ancient world. But the bulk of the early church pushed back against those ideas 
and held fast to the Apostles' Creed. They remembered that like no human being ever, Jesus had been conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And they were convinced that Jesus was not just touched by God, but that he was conceived by and of one substance with this holiness himself. And the way Jesus had talked about his heavenly father made it clear to the early church that in some mysterious and magnificent way, he had been, as John says in his gospel, with God in the beginning. And the song that those Christians, those early Christians sang about that belief eventually won out over the song that Arius was propagating. And some of you know that song. We call it the Gloria Patri. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. As my friend Mike Woodruff remarks, it was a fight song against the Aryan controversy. Uh, these were fighting words defending the idea that Jesus Christ is eternal. The virgin birth was the birth of none other than God himself into human flesh. And now the cross made complete sense to the church. Jesus was both human and divine. Because he was born of a real human mother, Mary, Jesus brought real human flesh to the cross to pay the price for sin. But because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, he was not tainted by the original sin that had marked Adam's descendants since the time of Eden. Jesus was a lamb, all right, a real human lamb, but a totally blemish-free lamb. In a nutshell, Jesus brought the reality of humanity and the purity of divinity to the cross, and in this way, he was the one life whose sacrifice would be sufficient to wipe away the sins of the world. This is why this statement in the creed has mattered so much to Christians through the years. I want to name another reason, however, and that is simply the fact that the virgin birth also demonstrates that God can do miracles. Now, I know some of us get a little confused or skeptical about that at times. Do miracles really happen? It has been the conviction of the Judeo-Christian tradition through the centuries that miracles not only do happen, they undergird our daily life. David Ben-Gurion, the late prime minister of Israel, once remarked, anyone who doesn't believe in miracles simply isn't a realist. I like the way author Wendell Berry puts it in one of his books. He says this, the miraculous is not extraordinary, but actually the common mode of existence. The miraculous is our daily bread. Whoever really has considered the lilies of the field or the birds of the air and pondered the improbability of their existence in this warm world of ours, within the cold and empty stellar distances that define everything else, whoever's really thought about that will hardly balk at the notion of water being turned into wine, which was, he writes, after all, a very small miracle. We forget, he says, the greater and still continuing miracle by which water with soil and sunlight is turned into grapes every year. And all over the planet, When your whole life and your whole continuation is a miracle, when you're surrounded by and swimming every single day in a miraculous grace the way fish live in water, it becomes really easy 
to stop even recognizing the stunning power that's at work for us, for our behalf, all the time, everywhere. Mothers often get this, I find. They often understand this fundamental quality about life. What mother has not thought sometimes, if only these kids could wake up and recognize all of the good they have, all of the good that surrounds them and has been put in motion for them and how frequently they've been rescued from dire consequences by the hand of a heart that loves them, if only they could understand it. Moms often get this. Like children, I think, we want more proof, more repeated proof of God's miraculous power. We want to be told again and again and shown again and again that God truly loves us and is really at work for us. We want him to give us fireworks and candy, in a sense, to prove his reality and his action. Even though we are daily surrounded by all of the signs of it, the Bible makes clear that God can do those things. He can pull off fireworks. He did bang at the beginning of the creation. He did again and again through the life of Jesus. Some of us can tell our own stories and experiences of miraculous grace that have touched our lives. God can do what is impossible according to the laws of biology and physics because he created those laws and has the capacity to work within them and to suspend them. As Peter Larson remarks, the life of Jesus itself is bracketed by two impossibilities, a virgin's womb and an empty tomb. Jesus enters into our world through a door marked no entrance and he leaves through a door marked no exit. The very life of Jesus is testimony to miracles. But why doesn't God do more spectacular things? I mean, why not more virgin births? Why not more resurrections? Why not more stunning healings? A lot of us would like to ask, given that we know some people who could use that kind of healing right now. The great missionary E. Stanley Jones once answered that it's because, like a good mom or dad, God wants to inspire our confidence without removing our initiative. Jones writes, I, I believe in miracles, but, but not too much miracle. For too much miracle would weaken us. It would make us dependent on the miracle instead of on our obedience to natural law. And so God gives just enough miracle to let us know he is there, but not too much, lest we depend upon it when we should depend on our own initiative, the capacities and gifts he's provided us with, and on his orderly processes for our development. Have you ever noticed when you've been reading through the Bible how when Jesus would do a miracle, he would often say to people, don't tell anyone about it. I mean, that happens a lot in the Bible. Philip Yancey observes that Jesus often asked those who'd seen a miracle not to tell anyone. He always, I mean always, turned down requests for a demonstration to amaze the crowds, or to impress important people. Jesus recognized early on that the excitement generated by miracles didn't readily convert into a life-changing faith. They just didn't really ultimately change people in the way that one might think. And for this reason, Jesus preferred to give people signs not proofs of divine power. A proof, if you think about it, is something we demand. Give me proof. It, it's something that we ask when we want something for ourselves. A sign, says Yancey, 
is merely a marker for someone who is looking in the right direction. It's an encouragement for somebody moving already in the right direction. Which brings us back to the person of Mary, the remarkable mother who is memorialized forever in the words of the Apostles' Creed. If ever there was a human being who had her eyes set in the right direction, in the kind of direction that God could use powerfully, it was this remarkable woman. Sometimes people tell or remember the story as if Mary was something of a victim of God. Have you ever heard people kind of talk that way? Oh, she was a heroic victim, mind you, but a victim nonetheless. In this version of the story, the angel comes to Mary and says, surprise girl, you're pregnant, but it's God's baby. Isn't that good news? And I think that had I been approached that way, I would say no. No, most people do not like that kind of surprise, much less being physically overwhelmed against their will. We even have a word for that. But that's not the story here. That is not the story of the nativity of Jesus or the conception of Jesus. This is not a tale about a woman that God took advantage of. It's not about a woman even who suddenly found herself pregnant and courageously kept and raised the baby. That would be a wonderful story, but it's not the story either. The narrative of the virgin birth is about a woman who is clearly not yet pregnant when the angel showed up and who could still have made the choice to say, no, 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 I've got a plan of my own. As Albert Wynn observes, what the virgin birth teaches us is that Jesus might not have been born. God's great central purpose in history through the life of Jesus might never have been achieved if there had not been a simple peasant girl who was willing to respond to God's initiative and to face all the pain and all the risk and all the unknown and all the suspicion and all of the shame from those watching and say, nonetheless, I quote, I am the Lord's servant May your word to me be fulfilled. To bring us to a close today, let me just say that the virgin birth teaches us a lot of important things about who Jesus is and how God works. But it finally reminds us that miracles usually come after obedient self-giving. Mark Job, our guest preacher last week, recalled that the miracle of the multiplying food would never have happened had a child not offered up his lunch and had the disciples not obeyed the somewhat irrational command of Jesus to take that little bit of food and to start breaking it into pieces for the huge crowd of 5,000. It took that offering It took that obedience for the miracle to unfold. But this pattern is actually everywhere (laughs) in the Bible. The miracle of the magnificent catch of fish, Peter's great catch of fish that some of you will remember would never have happened had Peter not offered up his tired body and obeyed Christ's apparently irrational call to throw the nets over again after professional fishermen had spent an entire night fishing that very same spot and found nothing. But Peter offered that tired body 
and cast the net over obediently. The miracle of our forgiveness from sin would not have happened without Jesus voluntarily offering up his life and remaining obedient to his heavenly Father's commandments all the way to the very end, all the way to the very cross. And on this holiday, let me also observe that the miracle that is you and the miracle that is me or the kids in our church or our families, as messy and unfinished as we miracles are, these miracles would never have happened without mothers who offered themselves up and obeyed the call to love us, lift us, work on our behalf when it was not easy to do. Yesterday, Sue Ann Camfield shared with the congregation that joined us for our afternoon service a, a wonderful story from her own life in which she was talking with her uh, wonderful son uh, about the early years of his life and, and asked, in effect, do you remember I, when I did this and when I did this and when I did this and when I did this? And the boy simply responded to her, Mom, I'm sorry, no, I don't remember any of that. And it can feel for mothers sometimes, Sue Ann said, as if, you know, they wonder sometimes, am I seen? Does my faithfulness really matter? And as I'm watching her son Clay yesterday afternoon standing up and leading a crowd of hundreds in worship, I think to myself, oh yes, Sue Ann, your faithfulness matters. God does see you as he sees all of you others who are offering yourself up and stepping out obediently and faithfully to serve God's purposes in the lives of others. So I wanna say thank you, mom, my own mom. I wanna thank all of you other moms and the women of our church for being God's servants the way that you are. Thank you for seeking to let his creative word be fulfilled through you. You are so very worthy of honor, not just today, but every single day. And Mary is as well, which is why the apostles made sure we would still be speaking of her every single time. We said the Apostles' Creed because God does miracles through mothers. This I believe. Would you rise to your feet with me? And I want to invite us now to say the Apostles' Creed together. And in the ancient manner of the church, this is what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
As we prepare to go today, I want to say thank you for submitting yourself to a lesson in Christian doctrine today. It's not the normal bill of fare on a Mother's Day, but one of the things my own mom taught me was the importance of remembering the tested, tried, and true verities of life and holding fast to them. And in this series, we are doing that together. We are taking hold once again of the core convictions that have been the strength and the foundation from which Christians have gone to live their life wherever they go. And wherever you go today, please do remember how beloved you are. (laughs) That God so loved the world that he sent his son, that he did this in a miraculous way so that his grace might work its way into every fiber of your life, my life, and the entire creation. And so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord our God lift up his countenance upon you today and give you his grace and his peace and his strength and all the riches of his presence as your daily companionship until we meet again and forevermore, amen. And if you are here in the sanctuary with us today, we thank you so much for holding your place until the ushers come to dismiss us. Thank you and may you have a wonderful Mother's Day.